Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. This week we are going to continue our study of Genesis 25. So, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25, and we're just going to read a few verses in it, uh, taking up where we left off last time, but uh, we're going to do this in pieces. So um, open up, if you've got a complete Jewish Bible, to page 25, which is uh, Genesis chapter 25, and we're going to read from verses 12 through 18, 12 through 18. Here is the genealogy of of, uh, Ishmael. Uh, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian woman bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, uh, listed in the order of their birth. The firstborn of Ishmael was Nabiot, followed by Kedar, Abdel, Mifsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tema, Yatur, Yafish, and Kedma. These are all the sons of Ishmael. These are their names according to their settlements and camps. This is how long Ishmael lived, 137 years. Then he breathed his last, died, and was gathered to his people. Ishmael's sons lived between Havilah and Shur near Egypt as you go towards Asher. He settled near all of his kinsmen. We ended last time by taking a brief look at the descendants of Keturah, one of Abraham's concubines. Now, just how many concubines Abraham had beyond Hagar and Keturah, we don't know. Likely there were others, with only these two playing any significant biblical role, which is why they were mentioned. Now, generally speaking, the sons of Keturah formed tribal confederations. And along with Ishmael, they make up the various Arab peoples that we see today. I say tribal confederations because unlike the Israelites who tended to stay closely identified with their individual tribes like Reuben and Simeon, Ephraim, Judah, Benjamin, so on, the sons of Keturah quickly became less identified with their individual tribes and had a band together in order to have any kind of staying power influence. In fact, most of the names of Keturah's sons have been lost to history, and we really can't follow their progress at all. The one tribe from Ishmael, that do, rather from Keturah, that does have a biblical impact is the tribe of Midian, who lived on the western end of the Arabian Peninsula, with the Gulf of Aqaba as one of their territorial boundary lines. This is the same Midian where Moses fled to from Egypt after he'd killed that Egyptian soldier. That same Midian where Moses found a Midianite wife and he lived there for 40 years as a shepherd. Well, in verses 12 through 18, we got a report on the line of Ishmael. And Ishmael was the dispossessed firstborn of Abraham and the Egyptian handmaiden Hagar. Now recall that Ishmael was a teenager by the time Isaac was born. Also recall that until Abraham's uh, only legal wife, Sarah, bore him Isaac, Abraham had declared Ishmael to be his firstborn son. Ishmael, as far as Abraham was concerned, was the son of promise, the son uh, of his who would carry on the covenant that Jehovah God had made with Abraham. It's no coincidence, the verse just previous to this section on the genealogy of Ishmael, that's verse 11, says this, after the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac. This was a reminder that Jehovah had rejected Ishmael as the son of promise. The son of promise was the one that God himself had caused to be born in a miraculous way by means of the dead womb of Sarah and the dead seed of Abraham. The son of promise was Isaac. Now let's review a little bit about Ishmael and gain some context because we're going 
to talk about Islam in this lesson. Before we look at the sons of Ishmael, who form the core of the modern Arab peoples, I want to point out that Ishmael is a Semite, just as Isaac was, and of course as Abraham was. What's a Semite? A descendant of Noah's son, Shem. Actually, the word Semite is kind of an error in itself, at least in the sense of how you pronounce it and spell it. The word ought to be Shemite, not Semite. Okay. The error is a typical Gentile one, because the Hebrew alphabetical character that we, um, that we transliterate as an S can be used in one of two ways, as a Hebrew alphabet sheen or as the letter seen, moving the little dot above the Hebrew alphabet character to the, to the far right makes it a sheen, gives us an SH sound like she or shoot or sharon. All right? Moving the little dot to the far left makes the same character a seen. It gives us the S sound like Sam or Seattle or Seaside. The word Shem is spelled with a sheen, not a seen. In any case, since Isaac and Ishmael had the same father, Abraham, and he was a descendant of Shem, then both of his children are Shemites, Semites. In fact, all the children that Abraham sired are Semites. So the Arabs and the Jewish people are very much related. They're all Semites. That's what makes the term we hear today so much anti-Semitic a malaprop. Anti-Semitic is technically a term that means what? Against Semites. Against the descendants of Shem. Yet, the way that term has been used is to denote bigotry against the Jewish people. And interestingly, it is the Arab peoples who are usually those who are most accused of being anti-Semitic. So we have the Arab Semites being called anti-Semite. Just another of those mindless phrases and terms that are regularly used in which no one seems to have any idea what they're actually saying. Now let me also express that because Ishmael was rejected by God as the son of promise, that doesn't mean that Ishmael was in some way cursed by God. Ishmael wasn't punished. He wasn't judged. He simply couldn't be the elected son of promise because Jehovah had determined that another, Isaac, was to be that son. In fact, to sort of make up for Ishmael being dispossessed of the firstborn status that he held until Isaac came along, Ishmael was given an almost equal physical inheritance as Isaac was. It's just that while Abraham would provide Isaac's wealth and prosperity, Jehovah would provide for Ishmael. So in our age, while the Arab peoples are generally Israel's enemy, they are in no way an accursed people any more than we in this room are just because the leaders of our nation have recently come against Israel by continuing to insist they divide the land. Now, the Arabs have been and will continue to be severely disciplined by Jehovah for coming against his set-apart people, just as America surely will be severely disciplined by God for forcing, or at least trying to force, Israel to turn over some of its land to enemies. Now, they already have been forced to turn over some of it. That would be Gaza. Now the effort is to divest Israel of Judea and Samaria, give it to the Palestinians of the West Bank. But Whereas the descendants of Noah's son Ham are generally a line of people who have been placed in a historical bind, in, in that indeed they do seem to be suffering since time immemorial from what Ham did to his father Noah, that is not the case with the descendants of Shem, 
Arabs as well as Hebrews, or Japheth for that matter. Now, I mentioned that for all practical purposes, we could say that the descendants of Ishmael, together with the descendants of Keturah, form the modern-day Arab peoples. And just like we in this room, there's not a one of us that are what you could call purebred. <laughs> that is, we are all, all likely hybrid mixtures of, of European or Asian or African stock. So it is with Arab peoples. These descendants of Ishmael and Keturah began commingling very early on. Therefore, we find mention in Isaiah chapter 60 of Midian, Ephah, Sheba, who are tribes of Keturah, living side by side with Kedar and Nabaot, who are sons of Ishmael. Now, just for the sake of good context, which is everything in Bible study, let's all read a little bit of out, out of Isaiah chapter 60 together. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. I want you to go there in your Bibles, just so you know where to find this. This is an end times prophecy about what has been happening and is continuing to happen with Israel, most of it right before our eyes. It's about the return of the Jews to their homeland, and of course, the return of the Israelites to their God-given land is an ongoing process that has been occurring over the last several decades. So open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 60, and we're just going to read verses 1 through 7. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 531. I love this passage. Arise, shine, Jerusalem, for your light has come. The glory of Adonai has risen over you. For although darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the peoples, on you Adonai will rise. Over you, will be seen His glory. Nations will go toward your light, kings towards your shining splendor. Raise your eyes, look around. They're all assembling and coming to you. Your sons are coming from far off. Your daughter is being carried on their nurse's hips. Then you will see and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with delight, for the riches of the seas will be brought to you. The wealth of nations will come to you. Caravans of camels will cover your land. Young camels from Midian and Ephah, all of them coming from Sheba, Sheba, bringing gold and frankincense, proclaiming the praises of Adonai. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered for you. The rams of Nebiot will be at your service. They will come up and be received on my altar as I glorify my glorious house. In the last few verses of what we just read, we see the names of those five Arab tribes Midian, Ephah, Sheba, Kedar, Nabaot. Names we have just finished reading in Genesis. For the sake of simplicity, what's being said here is that Arab peoples will eventually become friends and servants of Israel and bring them wealth and prosperity. Sure doesn't seem like that right now, does it? More pointedly, this is about the Arab peoples coming to worship Messiah in Israel. So for the most part, this isn't for today, although there are a few that are doing that now. There are Christian Arabs there, and they honor Israel. But this is mostly for the future. And the idea is that hordes of Arabs will bow down to the Hebrew Messiah. And when we look at the violence and hatred in the Middle East today, this is a, a very hopeful prophecy. So we must be very careful and how we disciples of Yeshua look at the Arab peoples. Yes, today most Arabs are on the wrong side of the issue with Israel. They have even chosen to abandon many of them. The God of their forefather, Abraham, to take on a false God, a non-God called Allah. 
They have chosen to be outright enemies of Christians and Jews because of this fact that is ignored in today's news media and today's tolerance-seeking churches who wish for alliances with Muslims instead of turning them towards the one true God. But as anyone knows who has heard my Palestinian friend Tass speak, there are many Arab believers in Messiah, so-called Christian Arabs. The Arab Muslims who believe in Allah are no more deceived than our family, friends, and neighbors who believe in no God at all. So while we must stand alongside Israel, knowing that will put us against most of the world, that is our duty. That is our call before God. That's what this ministry is about. Yet that does not mean we have to in turn hate Arabs and Muslims. We can hate what they believe. We can certainly hate what many of them do. And honestly, we're no more wrong to destroy those who try to destroy us or Israel than we were to fight Hitler's armies in World War II. But we sure don't have to revel in it. We don't have to have joy in the doing. Now, it is probably also a good time to mention a couple of other important things about Islam because Islam says that Ishmael is the father of Islam. And I'm spending a lot of time with this because of the inexcusable ignorance and outright agenda-driven misinformation about the simple history of the matter of Islam and Ishmael. I want to state right up front, Ishmael is not the father of Islam. He's not even the father of all the Arab peoples, just some of them. You see, Isaac and Ishmael represent the crux of the matter between Jews and Christians on the one side, Muslims on the other. Isaac and Ishmael are a distinct fork in the road. And please grasp that the differences between the Judeo-Christian world and the Islamic world are irreconcilable. There is no middle ground. There's no halfway point. There's no compromise. Islam says that the words from God, from Allah, are recorded in their holy book, the Quran. And the people of the promise of the covenants with Abraham come down through Ishmael. Of course, Jews and Christians maintain that the promise of the covenants come down through Isaac and are recorded in our holy scriptures, the Bible. Now, we just finished reading several chapters that explicitly stated that the son of promise, the line of covenant with Abraham, was by means of Isaac, not Ishmael. Interestingly, the Muslims acknowledge that is what the Bible says. They say that the Bible texts have been corrupted and they were changed by Jews and by Christians. That in fact, the Bible should say that it was Isaac that was rejected and that Ishmael is the real son of promise. Let's look at a couple of facts that makes that belief irrational. First of all, the religion of Islam didn't come into existence until the prophet Muhammad formed it. The Muslims agree with that completely. And Muhammad wasn't born until 600 years after the time of Jesus Christ. The last book of the Old Testament was written a thousand years before Muhammad was born. The last book of the, of the New Testament was written five centuries before Muhammad was born. Let me say that another way. The Old Testament as we know it was completed around 400 BC. The New Testament as we know it was completed around 100 BC, 100 AD, that is the final letters and books that eventually went on to form it. But the founder, the founder of the religion of Islam was born in 575 AD. And upon reading the Bible, 
Mohammed, the founder of Islam, claimed that it had been corrupted by the Jews for the purpose of discrediting him. Doesn't make very much sense, does it? It would be as though someone stood up today and claimed that the Constitution that's under glass in Washington, D.C., the one that was written 250 plus years ago, is a phony. And that person who just made that claim wrote the collect correct one. The original one in D.C. is corrupted and was corrupted just so you wouldn't believe the right one that this person wrote a decade ago. Now, is that about the most illogical, silliest thing you've ever heard? That is precisely what Islam claims about the Holy Scriptures today. I want to say it again. Islam says the Jews perverted Scripture centuries before Muhammad was even born. And the whole aim of it was to discredit Muhammad. By the time Islam was created by Muhammad, the Roman Catholic Church was dominant throughout Europe and Asia. Constantine, who declared the new Gentile form of Christianity to be the state religion of the Roman Empire, had been dead for over 200 years by the time Muhammad was born. It doesn't even matter that with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have the oldest scriptural writings of the Hebrews from before the time of Christ. And they have been studied, and photos of them have been released. They're on display in Jerusalem for any and all to see. And they agree fully with the Bibles, by the way, that you and I have before us today, the Old Testament, of course, proving that no corruption or change has occurred, at least not after about 100 BC, if ever. But Islam says that what Genesis should have said is that Ishmael was the chosen one and Isaac was the rejected one. This is the basis of the Islam that we know today. Second of all, don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. There are two ways and only two that we can know whom a God is. And that is by his or her name and attributes. There are those scholars who say, Allah is just Arabic for God. Well, while in the most general sense this is true, the only name for God in Islam is Allah. They reject all biblical names for God, even when those names are Arabized. yud heh vav -Hey, el Shaddai, any other biblical name or title for the God of the universe is wrong, according to Islam. So the God of Islam has an entirely different name than the God of the Bible. Further, the God of Islam glorifies death. The God of the Bible glorifies life. The God of Islam says that Muslims are to win over converts to Islam by means of the sword. The God of the Bible says that his believers are to win over converts by means of love and faith. The God of Islam says that how a Muslim behaves determines his eternal future. The God of the Bible says the conditions of one's heart determines his eternal future. The God of Islam has no Messiah for salvation. The God of the Bible says there must be salvation by means of Messiah. The God of Islam is a war God. The God of the Bible, God of the Bible is a shalom God. It goes on and on and on. The attributes, the character, the instruction of the God of Islam as found in the Quran is essentially the opposite of the attributes and character and instruction of the God of the Bible. And yet, we have government leaders, many Christian religious leaders tell us that Christians and Muslims are worshiping the same God. I've heard many pastors say, the best way to approach a Muslim is to say that we respect that they are worshiping God. They just don't know that the God they are worshiping is Jesus. The Hebrew Yeshua. And I hope I sound just a little bit riled up. Because this is insanity. It's blasphemy. 
of the worst kind. It's teaching God's people to believe that the worshiping of any God is fine, no matter what his or her characteristics, because any God is just the God of Israel. Well, that's not what Yehovah has been telling us all throughout the Bible. Now, if you love this country and your community and your family and friends, I want you to take this information with them and tell them the truth if you don't think they know it. Do you realize that what happened to the Israelites who worshipped both Yehovah and the gods of other nations was pretty bad? Those Hebrews who tried to be politically correct and tolerant by the standards of their era, things did not go so well for them. Those who declared that Yehovah and Baal were one, they were scattered to the four winds. Millions were destroyed. There's no difference between what they did and what we do today right in our places of worship if we declare that Yehovah, Messiah, Yeshua, and Allah are all one. And I remind you, God didn't deal with the Israelites person by person or family by family. Because their idolatry and blasphemy was so prevalent in Israelite society, he placed a national judgment upon them. And the same thing is prophesied in our time. That you or I don't personally believe or accept this heresy as truth does not exempt me or your family from suffering right along with others in our nation under God's terrible discipline. Oh, certainly, you may well be saved. So your eternal future is secure. But is that all that really ought to matter to us? Is our personal redemption? To heck with everybody else? Not for me. I don't think it's that same. I don't think it's that way for you. So let's examine now these tribes of Ishmael. Nabaioth was the firstborn son of Ishmael. His tribe is the people referred to as the Nabiate, who are mentioned in Assyrian accounts of their empire's battles against the people of the Arabian Peninsula, only a few decades prior to Judah being taken captive in Babylon. We know, we, we more know these people and their more modern scholarly designation is the Nabataeans. And even more recently, they are the Jordanians of Petra, the rock city of Petra. Kedar is spoken of many centuries after Genesis, and they form some kind of an association with the Edomite people, that Edomite, the descendants of Esau. These are people who wandered about as shepherds and goat herders throughout the Arabian and the Sinai peninsulas. Without doubt, they form at least part of what are the modern day Bedouins. Abdel is uh, known in Assyrian historical records as, uh, records as Idbail. They were conquered by Tiglath Pileser, the same fellow who was instrumental in conquering the northern kingdom of Ephraim, Israel. Dumas tribe shows up in Isaiah 21. They occupied a territory just north of Midian, along the, the Gulf of Aqaba on the Arabian Peninsula. The tribe of Tema dwelled around a, a well-known oasis north, northeast of Dedan because it was located on a heavily traveled caravan route that connected the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula with the lower reaches of Mesopotamia to the north. Jatur Nafish appear to have merged into one tribe. And they're described later on in the Bible in 1 Chronicles chapter 5 as the Hagrites, a contraction of Hagar, Hagarites, descendants of Hagar, who was Ishmael's mother. For all practical purpose, nothing else is known beyond pure speculation about the remaining sons of Ishmael, so we're not even going to bother to go there. Now, verse 16 tells us that the descendants of Ishmael lived in villages. In other words, they didn't build and reside in walled cities. They were rural. They were farmers and herders. Some were desert wanderers and traders. 
This accounts for the lifestyle that the Arabs developed in which because they lived in unfortified towns, they constantly attacked one another in hopes of gaining for themselves by taking from another. This mentality is still at work today. Part of what fundamental Islam is fighting against is a way of life that produces things rather than their traditional way of life that simply takes what others have produced. The traditional Arab tribal ways revolved around Arab tribes always seeking to take wealth and power from other Arab tribes. Even Muhammad, the founder of Islam, gained his notoriety as a great leader because he carried out attacks against other Arab tribes and, and he won. And the goal was always the same, spoils of war. He wanted their stuff. I want, you, I, want, I want you to let that sink in for a minute. Why is it that those Arab Muslim strongholds, strongholds of the world are also some of the most backward places in the world? You ever notice that? Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Egypt, so on. It's because, generally speaking, the people have no concept of working, producing, of fundamental fairness, of technological progress. When Islam attacked Europe in 711 AD, it was the European wealth they were after, not a European way of life, not European technology. They wanted to take what Europe had produced. This is what they want to do today. The war on terror is indeed a fight about preserving, hanging on to our way of life. And this is because the way of life Islam wants is you produce it, we take it from you. It is simply not within their cultural tradition to do anything else. Well, let's get back to the Bible. In verse 17, Genesis 25, we're told that Ishmael lived for 137 years, then he was gathered to his kin. Now here again, we find no reference at all to what he was gathered to his kin means. What does that mean? Who were his kin? Was this an afterlife? Of some sort that was being spoken about. If so, what did it consist of? Well, we're never going to find out in the Torah, and not very much more than that in the entirety of the Old Testament. Rather, this is just a nice way of saying he lived out a good lifespan, died peaceably, probably of natural causes. His people were undoubtedly his descendants as opposed to his ancestors. He had been divided and separated away from his father, Abraham, so Ishmael was the start of a new line. Being gathered to his kin, I feel certain, refers to his immediate, fam his immediate family, who would not be known, by the way, as Arab for several more centuries. Now, next we're given the general regional boundaries where Ishmael's descendants lived, and it starts at the border of the Sinai Peninsula with Egypt. That is, the reference to Shur, which by the way just means wall, and then goes north to the Assyrians of Mesopotamia. The location of Havilah is not known, as there are many locations in the Middle East that goes by this or variations of the name Havilah. But the inference is that the descendants of Ishmael tended to stay among themselves, for it says they camped alongside their kinsmen. They didn't seem to mix with the Mesopotamians or the Egyptians or the Nubians or many of the other non-Semitic peoples of the earth. Generally speaking, the descendants of Ishmael occupied areas to the north, south, and east of the land of Canaan. Well, now that you know more about Ishmael than you probably ever expected or wanted to, let's move on a little bit further into Genesis 25. Let's read verses 19 through 34. Back to Genesis 25 starting at verse 19. 
Here is the history of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, that's Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rivka, Rebekah, the daughter of Betuel, the Arami, from Padan Aram, and sister of Levan, the Aramani, to be his wife. Uh, the Arami, rather, to be his wife. Yitzhak prayed to Adonai on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Adonai heeded his prayer, and Rivka became pregnant. The children fought with each other inside of her so much that she said, if it's going to be like this, why go on living? So she went to inquire of Adonai, who answered her, there are two nations in your womb. From birth, they will be two rival peoples. One of these peoples will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. When the time for her delivery came, there were twins in her womb. The first to come out was reddish and covered all over with hair like a coat. So they named him Esav, completely formed, that is, having hair already. Then his brother emerged with his hand holding Esav's Esau's heel, so he was called Yaakov. He catches by the heel or he supplants. Yitzhak was 60 years old when she bore them. The boys grew. Esau became a skillful, skillful hunter and outdoorsman, while Jacob was a quiet man who stayed in the tents. Isaac favored Esau because he had a taste for game. Rivka favored Jacob. Now, one day when Yaakov cooked some stew, Esau came in from the open country exhausted and said to Jacob, please, let me gulp down some of that red stuff. That red stuff, I'm exhausted. This is why he was called Edom, red. And Jacob answered, first, sell me your rights as the firstborn. Look, I'm about to die, said Esau. What use to me are my rights as a firstborn? And Yaakov said, first, swear to me. So he swore to him, thus selling his birthright to Yaakov. Then Yaakov gave him bread and lentil stew. He ate and drank, got up, and went on his way. Thus, Esau showed how little he valued his birthright. Now, chapter 25 is more or less divided into three parts. The first third consists of the final important details of Abraham's life. The second third cons consists of calling out the descendants of Ishmael and giving some information about where they settled. And here in the final third of chapter 25, uh, we begin to chart the end of Isaac's story and the beginning of his son Jacob, Yaakov. The torch was being prepared to be passed yet again. Now Isaac is spoken of only sparingly as compared to his son Jacob, or Isaac's father, Abraham. For instance, we're told at the end of chapter 24 that Isaac married Rivka, but there's no information given to us about what went on during the first 20 years of their marriage. We do know that unlike Abraham, Isaac seems to have stayed closer to home. The known stories about Isaac center on Beersheba. And as far as anyone knows, he didn't live ever in Hebron, as his father had, except maybe near the end of his life. But like his father, he was also an owner of flocks and herds. In verse 21, we find that much in the same way as it was for his father, Isaac went a long time with his beloved wife, unable to bear him an heir. Now further, saying she was barren meant she had given Isaac no children at all, not even girl children. And as with Abraham, Isaac goes before Jehovah God and Jehovah grants his request for a son. So now Rebecca, Rivka, becomes pregnant. And while there are great similarities between the situation of Abraham and Sarah conceiving and the current problem with Isaac and, and Rivka, there's also great differences. For instance, Neither Isaac nor Rivka were elderly. They weren't beyond childbearing years. Even more, we don't find Isaac with any concubines. We don't find Rivka offering a handmaiden or a slave girl to bear a child in her stead. There appears to be no plans to do anything but live with the situation until God decides to do something or not. 
Is it that the Lord waited for Isaac to approach him before bearing, allowing him to, for, for his wife to bear children? Is it that the Lord was constrained by Isaac in that it was necessary for Isaac's prayers so that God could allow Rebekah to become fertile? There is substance, in, rather, this is the substance of many debates among spiritual leaders. Does God need our prayers? In order for him to act. I think not. But God does want to teach us. He wants a relationship with us. And what relationship with anyone is possible without communication? While oral speech is the typical human to human way of communicating prayer is the way God ordained for human to God communication. And while God does not need prayer, he wants prayer. Conversely, we humans, we need to pray. And I can't think of a way that builds a stronger faith than to communicate my needs or that of another to God and then marvel over his response to it. But this much longed for pregnancy by Rebecca almost immediately became very uncomfortable for her. And these apparently very active twin sons within her womb caused her to inquire of God just what is going on. Let's be clear this pregnancy worried Rivka. The activity within her womb was not normal in her estimation. Even an unusual Hebrew word is chosen to describe the goings-on. The word that is usually translated as struggle. And the word is va yitroyetsu. The verb has more of a sense of crushing, of thrusting, of smashing. Violence. Real violence. That's what was going on within her womb. And we'll continue this story next time. For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's Word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.